Welcome to IG's Trading the Markets podcast. I'm Jeremy Naylor. With the 80-seat majority secured now by the Conservative Party at the election, there's no more clarity on the direction of Brexit. The 31st of January is the date now when the UK leaves the bloc with the transition period lasting no longer than to the 31st of December this year. That's the line taken by British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who has in effect kept the threat of a so-called no deal or cliff edge Brexit if there's no agreement on the fundamental relationship from that date. Talks between the two have restarted, but with the new leaders within the European Union, Ursula von der Leyen as the new EU Commission President, replacing Jean-Claude Juncker, and Charles Michel as Donald Tusk's replacement as President of the European Council, does all this have the potential to change the dynamic? Dr Andrew Lelico joins us now. He's Managing Director of Europe Economics. Um, Good to talk to you. Thanks indeed for joining us here on the podcast. To what degree do you think things have changed, Andrew, in your mind from where they were before the UK election to the current position on the outlook now for Brexit and the ultimate relationship between the UK and the remaining EU group? Well, I think it was already uh, agreed with the um, with the European Union that, that Boris Johnson's deal, I think, changed everything. Really, it was a, a really big moment, uh, and uh, but and I think that Parliament probably would have passed that in the end, even if he hadn't uh, had the general election. The thing about the general election, it clearly makes means that it's absolutely certain that his uh, deal goes through, um, and so the, that risk of uh, no deal type scenario, which there was being discussed uh, later on last year and through much of 2019. In fact, that's all gone away now, so there's no chance of that anymore. Um, uh, and now we have the question of what happens about once we leave the European Union, we then have a fairly short transition period. I think that if he'd not had a majority, then Parliament probably would have uh, put him under pressure to extend the transition period at various points. So that makes quite a big difference. Uh, and then it play, puts him in a much better position to do things like uh, negotiate uh, at the same time with the European Union and with the United States and Australia in Japan and others, uh, which is what he says he'll be doing about the future trading arrangements. So it does make a large difference to where we go after, uh, but it, 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 um, even, though it, even though he already had the deal in place before the general election. Uh, I, think, um, I think a really key thing is, uh, that, so focusing on two, a couple of things which are key there, I think that he, he absolutely will not shift from this idea of, uh, um, of ending the transition period at the end of December 2020. He stood at a general election uh, on that basis. He's got a large majority, first conservative majority, uh, proper majority since 1987, uh, and he's managed to unite his party when it had been very badly split for quite a while. Uh, and if he were to deviate from that position of saying we're leaving in December 2020, that would reignite the splits and the people who voted for him would uh, feel betrayed, so he might well not get a majority in the same way at the next election. So I think all this discussion that uh, somehow once he got into office, then Boris would sell everybody out and some, suddenly uh, move away from the idea of uh, the transition period ending at the end of 2020, I think that's all for the birds. I think he'll definitely do that. Um, one, and one other thing to say, well, I'll let you back in in a sec, but uh, one other thing I would say is that uh, because he has this considerable majority, that places him very strongly not to make uh, doing a deal with the European Union by the 31st of December uh, uh, his overwhelming priority. So I think that um, he will neg- conduct these other negotiations in parallel. There's a pretty good chance we'll do a deal with the United States, um, which Parliament probably would have objected to before the general election. Uh, and uh, so it may- his whole position is much, much stronger. But is it feasible to do what's needed, though, between now and the end of the year for the UK to be able to stick to its deadline of the 31st of December? My point is I'm referring to some of the commentary around the periphery uh, from those that say there's just too much to do between now and the end of the year to get a deal in place. Well, that's up to the European Union, really. Um, if it doesn't want to do a deal by then, then there won't be a deal by then. Um, I think it really is as simple as that now. There's just the, 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 British, the British won't deviate from that. It would be absolute political madness for uh, Boris to deviate at all. The only kind of the, the, the consequence of that might be um, that if the European Union doesn't want to do a full deal by the end of 2020, well, maybe it could agree some um, um, transitional arrangement of not 
transition from the European Union, but transitional free trade agreement under the um, the old WTO, that old GATT 24 stuff that was being discussed a few months ago, um, of uh, 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 having an interim arrangement of very low tariffs or no tariffs, pending some fuller, more comprehensive free trade agreement, perhaps a few, in a few years' time. But if, if the, it's really up to the European Union. If the European Union wants to do a deal, there'll be a deal. If it doesn't, there won't. Uh, and um, I also think that the, that the uh, UK probably will do deals with other countries, such as the United States and mm. uh, Australia and so on, yeah. very quickly. And it, um, I would recommend it to do that. I think it would be much. I think it would be probably better to do deals with others before the EU deal, um, just to lock in the idea mm. that uh, the European Union um, won't be able to make us follow their rules and so on as part of the free trade agreement. Well, this, because this... that will just waste a load of time if we spend time negotiating that, uh, because it's just not on the table at all. No, I, I, absolutely. And I think this goes back to some of the, um, uh, the the feeling that came out of the meetings between Juncker and Theresa May that the EU had the upper hand. What is the feeling now within the EU group about the prospects for a good deal? There's much speculation that the EU um, does no longer have that upper hand. Do you see the EU having to forego more than they would otherwise have had to have foregone, foregone earlier uh, in uh, previous meetings? Well, I think it was very awkward negotiating with Theresa May in particular. Uh, this business of having up hands a bit peculiar in that uh, I think that Theresa May's team um, saw themselves as allies of the um, European Union in working against the um, the uh, foolish voters who t- decided that we were going to leave. Uh, and I, I, so I, it's a bit difficult whether you really say that the European Union had the upper hand. I mean, what they what they tried to get Theresa May to do was exactly what. Theresa May wanted to do anyway. She didn't want to do anything different, really. Uh, but she was trying to uh, manoeuvre things into a situation where we were locked into a customs union uh, with the European Union over the longer term, and uh, we uh, followed European Union uh, single market rules in various areas. So she basically wanted to get to a situation where she could control um, uh, immigration more, but otherwise nothing much changed. Well, that's just not... I mean, that might the European Union might have been prepared to go along with that. I don't know whether you really call it a victory of the European Union, if that's what the British policy was anyway. The situation now has changed radically. So uh, the the European Union uh, is now in a position with the UK where the UK has a, has a completely different set of objectives. Uh, and so it's no longer... Um, it's a, it, now the question is, will the European Union be able to make the UK do anything that the UK doesn't really want to do? And it's not very clear to me that it will. Uh, the the uh, EU uh, might prefer that the UK would follow its regulations, but the EU had previously did say to the UK that it would be reasonably happy with a Canada-style uh, free trade agreement, and that's what Boris Johnson wants anyway. Um, they, they may want to ask for some additional level playing field conditions over and above the Canadian ones because of geographical proximity, and they may want a few extra conditions over things like fishing. Um, so there's a few things to, uh, to discuss about that, and there may be a bit of give and take. But the basic position will be uh, that there'll be a free trade agreement with without dynamic alignment. There may be some agreement to alignment in respect of a, um, a few legacy sectors where we, don't, where we would probably do the same things as the European Union yeah. anyway. Yeah. Uh, and th- but uh, there'll be a regulatory freedom for all the new stuff that the British really care about. They'll be wanting to mm. change, com- do completely different things from the European Union on digital single market issues or um, a- AI or um, driverless cars, green technology, all kinds of things. And that regulatory freedom is an absolutely fundamental part of the whole uh, concept of what Brexit is about. One of the uh, one of the big reasons I know for leaving the European Union for those that really desperately wanted to do it was because that there were other areas around the world that were growing far faster and that of course remains the case. What sort of EU is the UK leaving behind economically do you think? Is it in a parlous state or are we now at the bottom and things can only get better for the EU? I think it has been in a parlous state. I, I think the really key thing for the EU has been governance issues. The UK was actually a destabilising force within the European Union. Um, the, to, to, to make proper progress, to make the uh, euro viable um, and events come to, to achieve a proper uh, European uh, decade uh, of growth, uh, I, I think the European Union needs much more political integration. I basically buy the Macron-type story that, that we need to have much deeper political 
political union for the uh, for the European Union to flourish. Uh, I would have thought that the Brexit is an excellent opportunity for the European Union to purge itself of the non-Euro EU, which I think was never really supposed to be part of what the EU was about, and just is, is pretty much a failed concept. Uh, and to um, advance m- m- more towards political union. Now they aren't really, they haven't embraced that as much as I would have hoped that they might. Um, They still talk the talk more than walk the walk uh, in those sorts of areas. Um, But uh, I think that people recognize the reality that that's where they have to go. And it's a, it's a tension between the underlying impetus of the European Union, which is always to move towards deeper political union, and the logic of the arrangement, which says that that's necessary, and firefighting on a day-to-day basis, which they've been engaged in for a number of years, um, uh, just so that you get through to tomorrow without the wheels falling off. And I think that they still have some concerns about that and exactly how that's going to work with Brexit, whether that might destabilize things again, um, whether other people might seek to leave or, and of course they have ongoing issues with various countries such as Hungary um, and struggles I mean, you know, or, or, or the economic issues never really go away issues like the Italian debt situation and yeah. the Italian budget so they, they've got all of these things still to struggle with but I would have thought that if they can achieve if they can resolve their governance issues which is really just a matter of will of sucking it up and doing it then we could have a really strong European decade I think that a um, deeper political union within the European Union is one of the great geopolitical projects of the 21st century it's a very exciting concept which should work well uh, and they just really need to get on and do it how about the UK economy um, after the 31st of January on through and towards the end of the year and beyond um, as exciting here in the UK as it is going to be in the European Union? I'd say the short term in the UK is rather brighter than, you, than a lot of people are giving us credit for because I think that we have a lot of deferred investment uh, which was just waiting for the resolution of um, Brexit uncertainty and would have, come, uh, would have come into the UK, been invested in various things, um, regardless of how, the, of how things turned out, even if it was a no deal or even if you agreed to customs union, whatever the resolution was, just simply getting rid of the uncertainty would, would have released uh, some uh, wave of investment. And of course, uh, uh, with Boris Johnson's deal, then that is a particularly favourable scenario for investment. So I think we'll see uh, a short-term investment boom in the UK. I think we could see quite strong growth over the um, uh, next um, 12 months. Then once you go a little bit further ahead, you're going to have to have some of the adjustments to um, being outside the European Union's customs and single market arrangements. So there'll be some transitional costs into 2021, 22, uh, and then I think we should be starting to grow a bit faster into the second half of the 2020s as the consequences of some of these new technologies coming on board and the opportunity for the government to apply policy to um, regulate in the ways that it wants to uh, will tend to favour certain sectors over others and uh, in the, with the regulatory ar- arrangements uh, and and I, it certainly is within the government's hands to make things work better um, th- there'll be less fiscal pressure than we've had over the past decade uh, perhaps a more favorable international environment if the e- EU gets its house in order uh, for uh, for UK exports there uh, new opportunities created by new trade deals with um, new, uh, um, the US Japan Australia and others uh, and so I think it's quite an exciting time for the e- UK economy over the 2020s as well. Okay, look, uh, Andrew, it's a pleasure. Thanks indeed for joining us. Dr. Andrew Lillico there from uh, Europe Economics, where he is Managing Director.